This meeting is now being recorded. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us early on this Tuesday morning. And this is the sixth and final webinar in my asthma and COPD webinar. Uh, my name is Karen Meyerson, and I'm currently the Director of Commercial Care Management for Priority Health. Um, previous to this position, which I have uh, accepted uh, just two months ago, I was the uh, manager of the Asthma Network of West Michigan, the Asthma Coalition, serving West Michigan for 20 years. Also worked as a nurse practitioner in an allergy office, seeing patients with asthma and allergies, and I'm also a certified asthma educator. So I'm here today to talk about um, COPD, and we did the webinar yesterday that was about managing COPD, diagnosing, and, and of treating COPD. Today, we're going to really focus heavily on the medications, some of which are similar or the same as those that may be used for asthma, and some of them may be different or new to you. So this comes from the uh, COPD guidelines, and unlike the national asthma guidelines, there are global guidelines for COPD that are followed worldwide. They're called the Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease, or they're also known as the GOLD guidelines, and they're usually updated every year, every other year. This is the website where you can access those guidelines and download them. And just a quick review of the definition of COPD. COPD is a common, preventable, and treatable disease. It's characterized by persistent airflow limitation that is usually progressive and is associated with an enhanced chronic inflammatory response in the airways and the lungs due to noxious particles or gases. So a couple things here that might differentiate it from asthma. Uh, that it is uh, certainly well preventable, as, as asthma can be as well, but a uh, treatable disease, and it has some airflow limitation that is progressive, which is typically unlike asthma. There's also this underlying inflammatory response, and this is enhanced inflammatory response, and oftentimes it's in response to um, noxious particles or gases, such as smoking, but not all COPD is caused by smoking. Exacerbations and comorbidities contribute to the overall severity in individual patients. So these are just some classes of therapeutic options, and we're going to talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. I'm going to start with the bronchodilators. These are really the mainstay treatments for COPD. This is not the same as asthma. In asthma, the mainstay treatments would be the daily control medicines, the anti-inflammatories such as the inhaled corticosteroids. You wouldn't expect or want somebody to be using a bronchodilator on a daily basis. With COPD, the opposite is true. Bronchodilator medications are central to the symptomatic management of COPD. So you would not expect to see someone with asthma, for example, be taking albuterol four times a day on a daily basis. That would not be unusual. In fact, it would be oftentimes recommended for somebody who has COPD. So they are prescribed on an as-needed basis, or they can be prescribed on a regular basis to prevent and reduce symptoms. So it's not unusual for someone to take scheduled use of albuterol if they have COPD. There are several treatments that are available. There are beta agonists like albuterol. There are anticholinergics, which are um, would be like a, a Spireva uh, or Atrovent. There's theophylline. There's combination therapy. And the choice really depends on medications that are available and each patient's response in terms of relief, uh, relief of symptoms and, and definitely minimizing side effects. So we're going to start with the short-acting bronchodilators, the same ones we use for asthma. They work very quickly. They help decrease shortness of breath. They're sometimes described as rescue or quick release medications, and you'll see the names there. You see the various brands of albuterol, Pro-Air, Valin, Provental. You'll see Lev Albuterol, which is a refined version of albuterol. There's only one on the market called Zopinex. Then you'll see a, um, combinations here of albuterol and atrovin. So in this one, you're mixing two bronchodilators in one medicine. And that would be the Combivent Resumat or Duonep, which is a nebulized medicine. And then there's just Atrovent alone, which is an anticholinergic alone. So those are all considered short-acting bronchodilators. They, again, they can be used as needed, or they, they can be used on a scheduled basis, on a regular basis. So the, there are also long-acting bronchodilators, and those are convenient, and they may be more effective for symptom relief than short-acting because, obviously, their, their effect is longer-lasting. Uh, they can reduce exacerbations and related hospitalizations, improve symptoms and health status. Now, again, we would never see that used in the world of asthma. We would never put somebody on a long-acting bronchodilator, long-acting beta agonist by itself um, because of the black box warning. We would not do that without adding in an inhaled steroid. In case, that is permissible to be on a long-acting beta agonist alone. Hearing a little bit of um, reverberation there, someone put your phone on mute, please. Thank you. 
Um, combining bronchodilators is also possible and can also be effective and actually be, maybe more effective than a single bronchodilator. So these are the different types of, of bronchodilators I'm talking about. There are the LABAs, the long-acting beta agonist, LABA, and that would be things like Cerevent and Foradil, and then there are the LAMAs, long-acting muscarinic receptor antagonists, and those are the anticholinergic bronchodilators. You have the LABAs and the LAMAs. You'll want to pay attention to those acronyms because I'll be using those more. When you see LABA, LAMA, those are just two different classes of bronchodilators. They can be used independently. They can be used together because they work differently. You could have someone on two different versions of that bronchodilator at one time, a LABA and a LAMA, because the LAMA blocks the parasympathetic nerve reflexes that cause the airways to constrict, so they allow the airways to remain open. And they bind to those muscarinic receptors and inhibit the acetylcholine-mediated bronchospasm. So they have a different mode of action than the LABAs, so they can indeed be taken together. There are two different types of bronchodilators that can be used effectively together. So studies have shown that combination therapy can actually even be superior to either agent used alone. So what we're seeing now is possibly, potentially, in the very near future, is even triple therapy. There could conceivably be an inhaler that comes out with three different medications in one that would be used for COPD. So it would have two different bronchodilators, a LABA, a LAMA, and an inhaled corticosteroid, LABA, LAMA, ICS. So that's not on the market yet, but it could be coming down the pipeline. So now we're looking at the long-acting bronchodilators, and these are the single agents. And you can see um, the names there. You, you can see both the brand names as well as the generic names. And you'll see which class it falls in, LABA or LAMA. And some of these are VID or every 12 hours, and some of these are once a day. So you'll just see that there are various, there are more and more coming out seemingly every day. But some that you may be familiar with is Spireva, and that is a LAMA. That's, that's an anticholinergic that's once a day. Uh, then there is Dalmeterol or Cerevent, and that's a LABA, and that's twice a day. And there's Formoterol, uh, which is a LABA, and that's also twice a day. Then there's Aformoterol, which is also Bravana, and that's a LABA, which is also twice a day. Then there's Indacterol or Arcapta, and that's a LABA once daily. Uh, there's also Tudorza Pressair Aclidinium, and that's a LAMA, which is twice a day. Umequidinium, which is in cruise, which is a LAMA, and that's once a day. So I don't expect you to memorize all this, but just so you know that there are different formulations. Some are LAVAs, some are LAMAs, some are once a day, some are twice a day. That's the important thing to know. And then there's combination um, agents, and one of them is um, a Noro, which has two bronchodilators, the two classes in one. It has the uh, umequidinium, which is the LAMA, and has the Lantrol, which is the LAVA. So that's got those two bronchodilators in one. And then Teotropium and Olodadlerol, which is Steolto, and that also has the same combination of the both different types of bronchodilators in one device. Then you may wonder, what about the inhaled corticosteroids? It's the mainstay of asthma. What about COPD? Well, what they have found is that regular treatment with inhaled corticosteroids can improve symptoms and lung function and quality of life especially if someone has a more severe stage of COPD if they've had frequent exacerbations. Then it can be helpful. But there is also, especially since COPD can, can be found in older populations, it does increase the risk of pneumonia. There have been some, um, some evidence of pneumonia in that population. Uh, and we have found that withdrawal from treatment with inhaled corticosteroids can lead to exacerbations. So it's not... The, the first line of treatment is it may be certainly with someone who has asthma, if they have persistent asthma, but it can be added in a little bit later. Oral steroids are typically reserved for exacerbations, again, because of um, there's tremendous risk. And there's also tremendous benefit. You have to weigh the risks and benefits. So we would rather add long-term treatment with inhaled corticosteroids to bronchodilators, um, especially for the patients who are at high risk for exacerbations than putting them on long-term oral steroids just because of the multitude of um, side effects. Now, long-term therapy, monotherapy, then using inhaled or oral corticosteroids alone is not recommended because these are less effective than a combination ICS and LABA. So there again, that's different from asthma. You could have somebody with asthma on, on monotherapy, just an inhaled corticosteroid and, and manage very well. That's not recommended for COPD because it is more effective with COPD to combine that inhaled corticosteroid with a LABA or a LAMA. So regular treatment with ICS does not modify the long-term decline of lung function or mortality risk. It can help 
certainly with symptom at, symptoms. It can help reduce exacerbations, but it is not going to change overall lung function. And again, there's always a concern about side effects of ICS, especially in an elderly population. There's the risk of pneumonia and increased risk of fractures with long-term exposure. So combination therapy and inhaled corticosteroid combined with a long-acting beta-2 agonist is more effective than each individual component. It can reduce exacerbations. Remember, the combination therapy can also be associated with that increased risk of pneumonia because of the corticosteroid component. And adding uh, a long-acting beta agonist as well as inhaled corticosteroid to an anticholinergic appears to provide additional benefits. That's where the triple therapy comes in, two bronchodilators and an inhaled corticosteroid triple therapy. So combination therapy, these are the meds that are on the market currently, Advair, which has been on the market probably the longest. That's fluticasone or flovent and salmeterol or cerevent. Then there's Simbacort, which is budesonide, or it's also known as Pomacort and Formoterol. Then there's Dulera, which is Mometazone, which is the same medicine that's in Asmonex, and Formoterol. That right now is currently indicated only for asthma, although in some cases it has been used in folks with COPD. But Advair and Simbacort do have COPD indications. And Brio, the last one, also has a COPD indication, and that's a newer one, and that has a 24-hour um, version of Flovent and Eumeclidinium, which is a lava, so that is one inhalation once a day. Again, these are most effective and recommended for patients who are at high risk for exacerbations. The same black box warning is still on there as it would be for all lavas. A newer medication are the phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitors, roflumilast or daily rest, this is an oral medicine that acts as a selective long-acting inhibitor of the enzyme PDE4. So it basically has some anti-inflammatory effects. It is approved for severe, so it really is reserved for the most severe cases, for severe COPD associated with chronic bronchitis in particular. Side effects include, and it's mostly the GI side effects that we're most concerned about, diarrhea and nausea, but there's also headache, insomnia, abdominal pain, depression, that sort of thing. So it can be effective. It is usually reserved for the most severe cases. In patients with severe and very severe gold, uh, COPD, uh, that would be gold three and four stages, and a history of exacerbations and chronic bronchitis. So you can see it's really for quite specific um, stages and patients in particular. This phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor, roflumilast, can reduce exacerbations that require oral steroids. So it can be helpful in reducing exposure to oral steroids. Next, we're going to talk about the methylxanthines, and these are the theophylline medicines. Um, you may not be hearing as much about them anymore. They're simply not used as much anymore as they used to be, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, so theophylline is considered a mild bronchodilator, a mild anti-inflammatory medicine. It seems to improve the breathing by increasing the strength of the diaphragm if it's weakened and stimulating the breathing control centers in the brain. The problem is side effects are multiple with the aflin, the methylxanthines. There's nausea, vomiting, can be seizures, uh, arrhythmias, insomnia, nervousness. Um, we can sometimes help reduce these side effects by avoiding caffeine because chemically, actually, the aflin and caffeine are very, very similar. In fact, in the old, old days, uh, before we had more effective medicines to treat asthma, I mean, this is before my time, uh, they, they would sometimes tell people to drink coffee when they were having an asthma flare because of the caffeine, which acted very much like theophylline. Uh, so the, the, the problem is the difference between a therapeutic dose and toxicity is very small. There's a very narrow therapeutic window. So if you drop below the window, the medicine is simply not effective. If you exceed the window, you throw that patient in toxicity, which can lead to seizures and possibly death. So there are also multiple, multiple interactions with other prescribed medications that can make the alkaline less effective and potentially life-threatening because they can increase the theophylline level into the toxic range. So it, it does, it can work. A few studies have noted that compared to placebo, theophylline does provide small improvements in lung function as measured by spirometry. Uh, in an exacerbation, they can also provide small improvement in lung function. But in general, research shows that the small improvement in lung function does not justify the severe side effects for most people who have COPD. And in most cases, in most cases, newer and safer medicines have replaced methylxanthines or theophylline for the treatment of people who have COPD. Now that said, there certainly are a select number of patients who have been on theophylline for years, it works for them, and they stay on it, and that's fine. 
but in most cases, I, I would imagine that a lot of people are being put on uh, theophylline um, it, 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 rather than another type of medicine that's on the market because the newer ones are, are safer and more effective. So it's used because, um, because of their side effects. Methylxanthines are not considered first choice, as I said. They are usually prescribed most often for people with COPD who still have major difficulty breathing despite the newer medicines that are available to them. They still have persistent nighttime symptoms and they have frequent, rapid, sometimes sudden increase in shortness of breath like a COPD exacerbation. Uh, but the medicines and the illnesses can also affect how quickly theophylline is cleared from the body. So you really have to check theophylline level very regularly. Um, my daughter was on theophylline when she was diagnosed with asthma 30 years ago. That was all we had in those days. We didn't have inhaled corticosteroids. And, and a febrile illness would spike a theophylline level. So every time she got a fever, which happened frequently in children, we'd have to take her in for theophylline level to make sure she was going to uh, be toxic. So it is, there's a lot involved with it. Uh, and also smoking increases how quickly theophylline is cleared from the body. So a person with COPD who continues to smoke may need even larger doses of the medicine, which also increases their exposure to risk. So it is available. I just wanted to let you know that it is still being used, not nearly as often as it used to be in select cases. So theophylline is less effective and less well tolerated than the other medicines that are available, like inhaled corticosteroids and bronchodilators. There is some evidence for a modest bronchodilator effect and some symptomatic relief. Uh, and sometimes adding that to those medicines can increase the FEV1, the lung function. Um, but low-dose theophylline can reduce uh, exacerbations. It does not improve lung function. It will not improve lung function. So now we'll talk for a minute about oral steroids, uh, systemic steroids. So chronic treatment with systemic corticosteroids should be avoided because, as I mentioned, the unfavorable benefit-to-risk ratio. Are they effective? Absolutely. Are there risks involved with using them on a regular, consistent basis? Absolutely. So you really have to weigh those risks and benefits. Influenza vaccine, uh, these are other pharmacologic treatments that are recommended for COPD. Flu shot, everyone with COPD and asthma should get the flu shot, uh, as well as um, the pneumococcal vaccine. These are recommended especially in patients with COPD who are 65 years and older. Uh, the use of antibiotics other than treating exacerbations is currently not indicated. So we wouldn't put somebody on, with COPD on a, on a regular dose of any type of antibiotic. If they should um, develop a COPD exacerbation, that would be very appropriate. And actually, if it's introduced earlier, it can help prevent the severity um, of the exacerbation, or reduce the severity, I should say. So these are other pharmacologic treatments. Um, alpha-1 antitrypsin augmentation therapy. It's not recommended for patients that don't have that genetic deficiency. I talked about that yesterday. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is a genetic form of COPD, and only for those patients and specifically would they benefit from this augmentation therapy, and that's, that's not nearly as common as um, people who don't have that deficiency. There are also mucolytics, which can thin the mucus. That might have some benefit. Um, cough medicines, antitussives are not recommended. Vasodilators like nitric oxide is contraindicated in stable COPD. So there are, again, other better, safer options to use. What about pulmonary rehab? All COPD patients can benefit from exercise training programs. It helps improve exercise tolerance, it decreases symptoms, and it decreases fatigue. And usually an effective pulmonary rehab program is about six weeks. But the longer the program continues, the more effective it is. The problem is someone will go through pulmonary rehab, and then after it ends, they don't continue those exercises, and they really tend to lose a lot of the benefit of the exercise program. So either continual tune-ups or just doing the exercise on their own, they can definitely perceive um, long-term benefit and relief from these exercise programs. So they really have to be continued to be effective. So if exercise training is maintained at home, their health status remains above the pre-rehab level. So that can be very, very helpful. Other treatments, oxygen therapy. Some studies have shown an increase in survival rates in patients who use oxygen more than 15 hours a day. It can improve sleep, mood, mental alertness, stamina. Uh, there's also something called non-invasive ventilatory support. And this is using a positive pressure ventilation that delivers intermittent positive airway pressure, which is like vent ventilatory support using a face or nasal mask. And there's also, in severe cases, surgery that can be done. It's 
called lung volume reduction surgery. They take small wedges of the damaged lung tissue and they remove those to allow the remaining tissue to function better. Again, not first line at all. This is really reserved for the most severe cases. And in appropriately selected patients with very, very severe COPD, the most extreme version would be a lung transplant that has been shown to improve quality of life and functional capacity, but again, done rarely and in the very, very most severe cases. That's why when I was talking yesterday about the 25 million Americans who have COPD and only half of them are diagnosed, if we can diagnose them sooner and help preserve lung function and help preserve this worsening, significant worsening, we can oftentimes help them uh, mediate the results of long-term COPD and keep them from getting to this point. That's the goal. So how do we manage staple COPD? Well, long-acting formulations of beta agonist anticholinergics are preferred, are preferred over short-acting formulations. So the long-acting bronchodilators tend to work better than the short-acting just because they give them uh, a longer effect. Uh, based on the efficacy and side effects, inhaled bronchodilators are preferred over oral. So there still are some oral on the market, but inhaled are going to be more effective with fewer side effects. Long-term treatment with inhaled corticosteroids added to the long-acting bronchodilators is recommended for patients, especially if they have a high risk of exacerbations. Again, do not use, um, they, it's not recommended, I should say, to use inhaled corticosteroids alone, which is the opposite of, of asthma. Long-term monotherapy with oral or inhaled corticosteroids is not recommended for COPD. That's what I just mentioned. And the phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor, roflumilast, may be useful to reduce exacerbations in patients who have severe COPD and they also have chronic bronchitis, especially if they have frequent exacerbations. So now, just to review what we talked about yesterday when we were staging COPD and just to refresh your memory, this, these are the four stages of COPD. And if we look at this line here, to the left of this line, these are going to be folks who have fewer symptoms. That MMRC score is going to be 0 to 1. To the right of the line is going to be more symptoms. Above the line is going to be a higher risk of exacerbations. Below the line is a lower risk of exacerbations. So the least severe stage would be A. These individuals would have fewer symptoms and a lesser risk of exacerbations. The most severe stage would be D. These have more symptoms and the highest risk of exacerbations. So this tells us now what the recommended first choice is for those various stages. So for the, the um, folks that have the least severe stage, the mildest stage, which would be down here, they can use either a short-acting beta agonist or a short-acting muscarinic antagonist, something like atrovent or albuterol, on an as-needed basis. They don't have to have scheduled use. If they're using it as needed and that relieves their symptoms, that's fine. If they have, uh, here, if they have more symptoms but still not a higher risk of exacerbations, that's when we might choose the longer-acting bronchodilators, and they can use those on a regular basis, and they may do very well on those. As we go above this line, if they have fewer symptoms but maybe a higher risk of exacerbations, that's when we probably would add combinations, maybe the two bronchodilators together. And finally, the most severe case here, we would use one or two bronchodilators as well as adding the inhaled steroids. So you're just very similar to asthma. You're going to go up the stepwise approach or step back down. These are some alternative choices. I won't go into any of these in any detail, but again, you can just see this is where we put in the, we might be able to add in the PDE4 inhibitor, uh, just adding various combinations of these medicines. It, it, this is really where the art and science of medicine comes into play because something may work for someone with a certain stage of COPD may not work for the next person. So it really just a lot of it is trial and error or, or uh, based on patient and provider preference and what works the best for that individual. And these are some other possible treatments as well. These are also just alternatives, not preferred because you see theophylline on here. Um, but these are, because theophylline is still a possibility according to gold guidelines, not first line, but it is there as an option. So just to review here, looking at patient A, B, C, D, from the least severe, the mildest to the most severe, and you can just see it spelled out here in more of a graphic format. Recommended first choice would be the short-acting bronchodilators as you move up the line, then the long-acting bronchodilators, then here we're getting to the combination products, and here we're adding even more to the combination products. We're going to have possibly two combination meds here and maybe three or more down here in the most severe stages. So it just really takes you through that stepwise approach. 
Now, medications in each box are simply mentioned in alphabetical order. It's not preferred in that box. Now, what about non-pharmacologic treatment for COPD? Well, first and foremost, if the patient smokes, we really have to focus very, very heavily on smoking cessation, and that we're going to finish up this webinar talking about smoking cessation in particular. So patient A, B, C, D, doesn't matter if they're smoking, if they quit. If you remember what I showed you yesterday in terms of the decline in lung function, all of us, anybody who doesn't smoke, we have a natural decline in lung function that's very gradual as we age. People who smoke and continue to smoke have a much more rapid decline in lung function. And those who smoked but quit actually see that decline in lung function plateau a little bit and and certainly it does not decline nearly as steeply as those who continue to smoke. So smoking cessation is critical, especially in COPD, but it is critical. So smoking cessation is essential. Physical activity is recommended. And then the same thing here, flu vaccine and pneumonia vaccine. That's in A, that would be the mildest stage. But B, C, D, all the other patients I absolutely would benefit from smoking cessation, and they may need medications, which we'll talk about very shortly, to treat smoking cessation, as well as pulmonary rehab now, and then physical activity and a vaccination. So not a lot of difference in the non-pharmacologic treatment other than uh, pulmonary rehab would be added at, at, at um, not the most of your stage, but you know, as they're approaching anything beyond mild stage. It can definitely be a benefit. So we're talking about managing exacerbations, and just to review from yesterday, an asthma, uh, sorry, a COPD exacerbation is an acute event that's characterized by worsening of the patient's respiratory symptoms that is beyond normal day-to-day -day variations and leads to a change in medications. So again, patients who have COPD are probably going to be symptomatic daily, but this is a change from those daily symptoms, a, a change from the daily coughing, or a change from the normal sputum production. Anything that changes that is significant to warrant a, as a change in medicine is called a COPD exacerbation. So the most common causes are viral respiratory infections or infections of the tracheobronchial tree. The diagnosis relies exclusively on the clinical presentation of, of the, the patient, what they are complaining of uh, in terms of the acute changes of symptoms. The goal, as I mentioned, is to minimize the impact of not only the current exacerbation, but to prevent the development of subsequent exacerbations. Remember, each exacerbation knocks their lung function down a notch and they never regain it. So what we would use for exacerbations, short-acting beta agonists, with or without short-acting anticholinergic, so you can use the SABA, the SAMA. So uh, you can do something like atrovent, albuterol, together, alone. Uh, systemic corticosteroids and antibiotics are probably the next step then. They have been shown to shorten recovery time, improve lung function, reduce the risk of early relapse, treatment failure, and length of hospital stay. So that would be added in fairly quickly if you saw yesterday the COPD action plan. Uh, in the green zone, people would be taking their daily medications. In the yellow zone, they'd be ramping up their um, bronchodilators, but they can also oftentimes start either steroids or and or antibiotics fairly quickly in the process, prevent that exacerbation from worsening and uh, requiring hospitalization. The bottom line is these exacerbations can often be prevented. So exacerbations of COPD, again, are defined as an acute change in their baseline dyspnea, cough, or sputum, and that's sufficient to warrant a change in therapy. Evidence supports that exacerbations are acute inflammatory events. Remember, people with COPD have underlying chronic inflammation. This is an acute inflammatory event that's superimposed on that chronic inflammation. And the majority of patients who have COPD will have exacerbations in a 12-month study. Three-fourths of these individuals who had COPD had an exacerbation, and these exacerbations contribute to the decline in lung function and, and impact quality of life. So preventing exacerbations is rec recognized as a significant goal in COPD management. So if we look at exacerbations here and all the consequences, you have negative impact on quality of life, impact on symptoms and lung function, increased economic costs, increased mortality, and accelerated lung function decline. So for all of those reasons, we really want to try and prevent a COPD exacerbation. If one is beginning, we want to jump on it very quickly. That COPD action plan can help with that. If they can add in medicines and treat it aggressively and treat it early, just like with asthma, we can oftentimes halt the progression and keep it from worsening. 
So treatment options, if they are at the point where they are having an exacerbation, the next step could be um, certainly oxygen. Uh, bronchodilators are going to use the short-acting beta agonists with or without the short-acting anticholinergics. And then they, at this point, they would benefit from systemic corticosteroids because that can shorten recovery time and improve lung function. So typically, it's a dose of 40 milligrams per day for five days, but it can vary higher than that as well and for longer periods of time than that. And antibiotics um, should also be given to patients who have the three cardinal symptoms. They have increased dyspnea, they have increased sputum volume, and they have increased sputum purulence. So those three in particular, they would definitely benefit from an antibiotic sooner rather than later, and definitely those who require mechanical ventilation. What about admission to the hospital? Um, patients would be um, indicated if they have a marked increase in intensity of symptoms, if their underlying COPD disease state is severe to begin with, and you add an exacerbation on top of that, they don't have um, uh, they, they don't have a lot to deal with that, uh, so they would definitely be uh, thrown into trouble a lot sooner. Uh, onset of any new physical signs, um, if, if they, the exacerbation is not responding to medical management, if there are serious comorbidities present, if they have had frequent exacerbations, those of older age, and if they don't have home support, these individuals would be um, indicated for a hospital admission. So again, just to review for COPD, I encourage you to visit the website, goldcopd.org, download the gold guidelines. There's also um, a pocket guide, and they're very clearly spelled out, and, and there's a lot of great information on there about COPD, the treatment, uh, the diagnosis, the management, medications. And don't forget, World COPD is, World COPD Day is November 16th of 2016, raising COPD awareness worldwide. So with that, we're going to jump into the tobacco dependence portion, the, the last portion of the webinar today, talking about smoking cessation. Tobacco dependence is a chronic disease. So active smoking, we know, causes permanent changes to the brain structure and chemistry. And we also know that cigarette smoking maintains near complete saturation and thus desensitization of the nicotine receptors in the brain. So that's why smokers rely on smoking, because it modulates their mood and their arousal, and it relieves those withdrawal symptoms or both. But we also know that as addictive as tobacco is, there are highly effective treatments for tobacco dependence available today. So nicotine has multiple effects in the brain. It releases dopamine, which leads to pleasure and appetite suppression, norepinephrine, which leads to arousal and appetite suppression, acetylcholine, um, you can see arousal. Many of these are, are, are affecting learning and memory enhancement, um, mood modulation, uh, re reduces uh, anxiety and tension. Uh, they, they actually make people feel better. So that's why they get addictive. They get addicted to the effects of these various chemicals that are released by nicotine, and that's why people continue to smoke, and it's so difficult, and, and so uh, uh, difficult not only physically but psychologically to give it up. So the symptoms then, if you, if you look at this slide again and look at all the, the good that it does for people in terms of how well they feel, um, not necessarily physically, but in the brain, and then you take that away from them, of course, you're going to see the opposite effect. So you're going to see cravings for cigarettes. You're going to see irritability, frustration, hunger, increased appetite, tremors, uh, depressed mood, um, restlessness, anxiety, insomnia. They're going to have difficulty concentrating, slow cognitive performance. You know, and you tell somebody that this can happen, they're not going to be, well, sign me up. Of course, they're not going to want to feel that way. Nobody wants to feel that way. So we have to treat those symptoms so they are more likely to be successful with, with smoking cessation. And a wonderful toolkit that I would love to direct all of your attention to is the Tobacco Dependence Toolkit. This comes from the American College of Chess Physicians. It is available online. I mentioned this yesterday. You can go to the American College of Chess Physicians website, sign up for this toolkit. It is free. You will have to um, register and, and uh, give them your email address, and then you have access to this kit. But it is a wonderful, wonderful resource for healthcare professionals. Uh, it walks you through the whole process of smoking cessation, uh, medications to use, how they're used, how to, how to teach patients about smoking cessation. It is just a tremendous resource. So the philosophy behind that, that um, toolkit is if you can treat asthma, you can treat tobacco dependence. 
This toolkit was designed by a pediatric pulmonologist. So this is a, I, I know this, this gentleman, Dr. Farber, um, he is, treats children with asthma every day. And he would have people walking into his clinic. He's from um, Houston. And he'd have people walking into his clinic and treating the, the children with asthma, and the parents were smoking. And he would treat the children with asthma, and the parents were smoking. And it dawned on him, he said, I have to treat the whole family. I can't just treat the children. I have to treat the parents so they don't smoke around their child. So he developed this toolkit in conjunction with American College of Chess Physicians based on the asthma theory. If you can treat asthma, you can treat tobacco dependence. Because the goal of asthma therapy is we want people to have normal lung function and we want minimal to no asthma symptoms. The same thing with tobacco dependence. We want normal brain function and we want minimal to no symptoms of nicotine withdrawal. So think asthma, think nicotine dependence. If you can treat asthma, you can treat tobacco dependence. Just like with asthma, we have controller medications, we have reliever medications. Controller medications in asthma are inhaled corticosteroids. Controller medications in tobacco dependence are the quick relief medicines, the nicotine patch, uh, bupropion, uh, varenicline. Uh, these, are, these are the medicines that are used as mainstay, sorry, not quick relief, but the nicotine patches once a day. These are the mainstay medications that are used every day to control that nicotine dependence. However, just like with asthma, there can be breakthrough symptoms. So we need a quick relief medicine. And that's where we get the gum and the lozenge. They work much faster. That's where we get the nicotine inhaler, the nasal spray. These are quick relief or rescue medicines. And the severity of the disease guides the intensity of the treatment. And then there's even an option. So pre-medicate if you're going into an at-risk situation. You wouldn't walk in, if you have asthma, walk into a friend's house who has a cat, and you might be allergic to the cat. You're going to use your albuterol. Well, if you are a smoker and you're trying to quit and you're going into a high-risk situation, then treat for that. So again, treat tobacco dependence just as you would treat asthma. And I'll show you how that plays out in just a minute. So on follow-up visits, like with asthma, if the disease is well-controlled, we're, we're going to step down medicine. If disease is not well-controlled, we're going to evaluate for triggers and adherence and consider stepping up medication. So the medications are adjusted based on the control of the underlying disease, not on a fixed timetable. So that underlying disease is tobacco dependence. We're not going to say you're going to be on um, the patches for six, 12 weeks and you're done because everybody is different. And we have to really focus on what the severity is of that tobacco dependence. If it's mild, yes, they could be done in 12 weeks. If it's not, they can't. You're going to base it on the disease and not a timetable. So treating tobacco dependence, to so use the ARMR model. A is assess the disease. B is recommend treatment. M is monitor for effectiveness and side effects. And R is revise the treatment plan if needed. So first of all, we have to assess. Again, and I, I'm sorry I keep repeating myself, but just like with asthma and just like COPD, you don't know how to begin to treat a disease unless you know how severe it is. Well, we know how to stage asthma and, and stage severity. We just learned how to stage the severity of COPD with that, that, um, those squares, A, B, C, D. Well, we can also assess, believe it or not, the severity of nicotine dependence. There is a Fagerstrom test for nicotine dependence, and there's also a questionnaire for adolescents. Um, but this is very helpful for assessing how severe is your dependence on nicotine, and also what their previous experiences with smoking cessation. It's always helpful to ask, have you ever tried to quit before? Did it, how did it work? What did you use? How long did you quit? So that's helpful to know. But right now we want to know how severe is your disease currently. So the Fagerstrom test for nicotine dependence is just six questions, and they are uh, how soon after you wake up do you smoke your first cigarette? Is it within five minutes? Is it five to 30, 31 to 60, or is it over 60? Do you find it difficult not to smoke in places where you shouldn't, such as a church or school or movie, et cetera? Yes or no? What cigarette would you most hate to give up? Which cigarette do you treasure the most? First thing in the morning or any other time? How many cigarettes do you smoke each day? That's pretty obvious. Do you smoke more during the first few hours after waking up than the rest of the day? Yes or no? And do you still smoke if you are so sick that you are in bed most of the day or you have a cold or the flu and have trouble breathing? Yes or no? And you give yourself points. So seven to 10 points, they're highly dependent. Four to six points, they're moderately dependent. Less than four points, they're minimally dependent. So we've got a starting point. This really tells us how severe this tobacco dependence disease is. We're treating tobacco dependence as a disease, just like asthma and COPD. 
So now, now we have the, the way, a way to classify severity. We have a way to stage the severity of this disease. From zero, which is non-daily, they just say smoke in a social setting, to mild, moderate, severe, and very severe. And it depends on the cigarette use and the nicotine withdrawal symptoms and their score on the Sagerstrom test. So again, how many cigarettes you're smoking uh, and how, what, what is that timing to the first cigarette? If they can't, if they wake up and they can't go more than an hour, how soon do they need to smoke? How severe those symptoms are when they're trying to quit the, the withdrawal symptoms and then what their score is on the test. We also have to assess not only the severity of dependence, but also any comorbid conditions. Do they have other chronic diseases that, that can complicate this, like coronary artery disease or diabetes? Do they have underlying psychiatric conditions, or are they on other medications that could impact their ability to, um, to quit smoking? So then we're going to recommend treatment, and that treatment uh, intensity is based on the severity of the underlying disease of tobacco dependence their experience with tobacco dependence treatment, what has worked, what hasn't. And we have found that combination therapy is often more effective than single agent alone. So it's not just you want to quit smoking, here are some patches, here's gum, here's Zyban. Oftentimes it takes a combination of the medicines to be effective. So these are some treatment options, nicotine replacement products. The, so over the counter you have the patches and the gum and the lozenges. Prescription, you have a nicotine patch the nicotine inhaler and the nasal spray. And then you have some prescription non-nicotine medications. And one is bupropion or Zyban, and the other one is Renaclean, which is Chantix. So this may look familiar to all of you if you sat in on the asthma webinars. There's a stepwise approach to treating tobacco dependence, just as there is for asthma. And if you remember that step of severity, we're going to marry that step of severity to the pharmacotherapy. So it, a non-daily social smoker, they may just need a reliever or they might not need it at all. But anybody from mild on up is probably going to need a daily control medicine. And that could be a patch or Zyban or Chantix, um, or they might get away with just a reliever as needed. But up here, they might need something on a daily basis, and here they might need a combination of these medicines, uh, and they still may need a controller as well. So I'll show you what that looks like, because guess what? There is an action plan, just like there is for asthma. Again, remember, this came from a pediatric pulmonologist who treats asthma, and he based this on asthma treatment. So he came up with a, a tobacco action plan, a uh, freedom from tobacco action plan, that looks very similar to an asthma action plan, based on a traffic signal theory, green, yellow, red zone. And he, I, think it's, I think it's really ingenious. You look at the green zone here. Green is good to go. I have no real cravings for tobacco. I use my control medicine every day if I have it, or maybe not if they're just a social smoker. Um, but they're going to have a um, yellow zone, so they're going to have some rescue medicines on hand. So they're not so mellow. I'm craving tobacco. I might be feeling irritable or anxious. And this is where they can add in a rescue medicine. And then if they're in the red and they're really craving tobacco, I need a cigarette right now, what can they do at this point to help with that craving? So let's take a look at somebody, for example. Um, this might be somebody who's at stage two or step two. Um, they're, they're able to go more than 30 minutes when they wake up in the morning, but they're smoking under, under a pack a day between six and 19 cigarettes. They have some frequent withdrawal symptoms, and they scored between four and five on the Fagerstrom test. So they're kind of right in the middle, because the highest was 10. So they're kind of middling there. So this tells us they're at step two. That means we would probably start with them a nicotine patch or Zyban, and we would they would probably benefit from having a reliever on hand, um, which could be the the gum or the lozenges. So this might be what an action plan would look like for that person. So they're taking the nicotine patch and they use that once a day, and maybe they're going into a social situation. They're going to a friend's house and that friend happens to smoke, but this person is trying to quit. So they could. Um, maybe put some nicotine gum in their mouth before they head over to that friend's house. They're doing fine, but then they get there and they're really craving a, a cigarette. They can use that gum every 30 minutes as needed, but they're in the red zone, then they can use that gum every 20 minutes as needed. So you can see how you can just accelerate the dose. You can, you can escalate that to prevent them from actually lighting up again. So this is, is very helpful. Um, if they're in the red zone, 
um, then they can contact their physician to, uh, if, if what their treatment plan is doing is not working for them, because they might need stronger medicine at that point. So what if they're not ready to quit? Well, we have to think about the five R's there, the relevance, the risks, the rewards, the roadblocks, and repetition. So is it relevant to them to quit? Certainly if they have COPD, it would be very relevant to them. But what are the risks involved with quitting? Um, it's not that easy. So many people have stressors and that prevents them from, from even engaging in health-related behaviors. Um, there certainly could be rewards, as, and, and uh, better health is always a reward, but there are roadblocks involved with quitting, too, changing any habits like this, especially when you look at what nicotine is doing to the brain and giving that up and then changing to the withdrawal symptoms. It's not something people are, are going to go into um, and, and look forward to those uh, side effects of withdrawal. But repetition is really key. So just bringing it up again, and as I said yesterday, uh, it can oftentimes take sometimes up to eight t attempts to quit before they quit for good. So it, it, I always tell, would tell patients, don't beat yourself up if you quit and then you fell off the wagon and you started smoking again, because the more often you try to quit, the better the chances you're going to quit for good. And we really have to individualize that treatment so it's age appropriate and it's personally relevant. The reduction towards cessation, it's helpful to use the nicotine patches, even if they can't completely quit, we, they still need to um, use the patches at least as they prepare for cessation. And using the nicotine replace it to reduce smoking and gain greater control over smoking behavior can be helpful, but they do have to do that with caution because it is recommended not to use them simultaneously because that is adding a lot of nicotine to the system. What about e-cigarettes? get this question very, very often. So e-cigarettes are fairly new, um, but the FDA analysis has found that the chemicals in e-cigarettes can be carcinogenic and toxic, uh, and even in the vapor of these substances. And it has been found because these these e-cigarettes are, are not um, monitored; um, they are are not regulated. So they are coming over from other countries, and they have been found to have, contain things like antifreeze. Uh, so they can they are not safe, uh, and they're they're also used as a hook to get kids to smoke because they have wonderful flavors and they're pretty colors and the kids think they're cool. So they use chocolate and strawberry and mint and those are really designed to appeal to young people. So liquid nicotine is also a health risk to young children. They're very pretty vials, they have nice taste to them and children have accidentally ingested entire vials of nicotine and um, it has been fatal. So these, that is definitely um, uh, one of the reasons for um, the rise in poisoning incidents of these nicotine vials. But also uh, with inhaling the vapor, the fine particles uh, in the aerosol degrades lung function. I mean, anything that you're in, inhaling into your lungs is going to impact lung function. And we don't know, know yet uh, what those secondhand emissions are and if they're harmful to other people who are inhaling them. Um, we know the user can sometimes exhale, depending, again, because these are not regulated, formaldehyde and benzene and other toxins. But so there's no scientific proof that these are safer. And there's also the dual use dangers. There are some smokers who smoke cigarettes and smoke e-cigarettes. So some smokers might be using them along with traditional cigarettes. So they're getting a lot of nicotine. And at present, research regarding safety of e-cigarettes is not conclusive. So there are possible health risks of e-cigarettes, and they, they do appear to be less than the dangers associated with tobacco smoke. But again, these e-cigarettes are not regulated in the U.S., and there simply are not enough scientific studies on the risk to say that they're free, and they are not indicated as a cessation option. So one study in addiction did find that e-cigarettes um, were helpful in attempting to quit, but not in quitting, not complete smoking cessation. But the FDA has not found any e-cigarette safe and effective in helping smokers quit. We need more studies. People need help quitting, not help continuing their habit, because it, does, it doesn't do anything to stop that habit, that hand-to-mouth habit of smoking. So e-cigarettes are not approved as a cessation device. There are better, safer, and, and, and indicated medications to treat smoking cessation, as we just talked about. So what's the future of e-cigarettes? Well, for individuals who switch to vaping and not doing it along with cigarettes, sometimes that can impact favorably on cigarette use, but we still don't know those long-term effects on health. So there need to be studies to study the effectiveness of e-cigarettes to help smokers quit. We need to study the health status of individuals who have switched from smoking to e-cigarettes. Are they healthier when they're not smoking tobacco anymore? 
And we also need to research how e-cigarettes can be made safer, and they need to be regulated because people are inhaling these toxins into their lungs, and they're coming from other countries. We don't know what they're putting into them, and oftentimes they are toxins. So unfortunately, just as we wind up here, uh, tobacco has had a long history of promotion. And it's just amazing when you see how the pendulum has swung from this ad uh, talking about uh, something wonderful happens when you change to Philip Morris and you're going to feel better um, when you smoke. And even this, marketing to, Mar 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 to mothers in the 1950s, my mother knew enough to stop smoking when she got pregnant, had three children, never smoked through the pregnancies. And then at the end of the pregnancies, when she wanted to lose weight, her obstetrician told her to start smoking again so she, so she could lose weight. Unconscionable these days, but they didn't know anything better in those days, and, and cigarettes were marketed to, mo to mothers. And, and there are even people who have played physicians, and they were saying smoking is healthy for you. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. And then it evolved into the 1970s. You've come a long way, baby. And finally, you can see now, in 1971, there was a ban on advertising on television. 1998. It was 1998. We're talking less than 20 years ago that prohibited tobacco companies from targeting children. That's a very recent past. So tobacco companies in the 90s were still targeting children. And in the late 80s, you can see they were starting to put those warning labels on advertisements. So we have come a long way from Dr. Baby's asthma cigarettes that treats your asthma and your hay fever to these more graphic advertisements that show lungs and those graphic warnings, cigarettes cause fatal lung disease. My mind is not far enough yet because there's still too many smokers and they need help quitting. We need to treat tobacco dependence as we would treat asthma and, and be aggressive and give them the tools that they need to stop smoking. So again, remember, there's also a quit line, a Michigan quit line, 1-800-QUIT-NOW. There's some wonderful resources. Some patients may actually um, uh, be eligible for some free tobacco cessation medications if they call the quit line. Uh, for providers, there's the American College of Chest Physicians Tobacco Dependence Toolkit, and there's a website for that. I really do encourage you to go on there and just explore that toolkit. It's just a terrific resource for you. And I will leave that open for questions. And thank you again so much if you have participated in one or multiple or all of the webinars. I do thank you for your attention. It's been a delight for me to be able to do this today. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, and thank you again for providing this series for us. Um, are there any questions? I know that there was one a little while ago in the chat. Did you see that one, Karen? I do. Um, are there any studies that show if medications are effective overall when the patient does not stop smoking? Well, if you're talking for COPD, there are certainly some medications that can help. I, I don't know that they've actually done studies on how much more effective it is uh, if they smoke or don't smoke. The medications are treating the underlying disease process of COPD, so they can only be as effective as they can. But again, every time a patient lights up, they're counteracting the good the medications do, just with, like with asthma. So they're going to be they they are going to be somewhat effective in treating the symptoms but they certainly cannot be as effective as they would be if someone stopped smoking entirely. They cannot be as effective if someone continues to smoke. They just can't be. Oh, thank you, Tamara. Appreciate that. Any other questions? Karen, this is Sue. And, yes. uh, you know, as I was listening, um, I, I think a couple of things when I think about care management and the value we bring to the team is one is if we've sent someone through pulmonary rehab, mm -hmm. a big part of our role can be assessing the patient's understanding of the information that's being shared, and then monitoring and coaching the continuation of the tools and uh, interventions that they've learned. Would you, how long do you think a care manager should be involved with someone with COPD, and are those appropriate actions? 
Oh, yes, absolutely. And it really depends on uh, so many uh, factors. If someone has COPD, it depends on what stage disease severity they have. It depends on how frequently they're having exacerbations. It depends on how new they are in the diagnosis process, how much they understand the disease. Um, it depends on whether or not they continue to smoke. Uh, so if, if it, the, the problem is, as I said yesterday, we, we are only diagnosing maybe half of those individuals, and at, at that time we're diagnosing them at later stages. So I think there's a role for care management if we can not only help the individuals who are diagnosed at those later stages because they're already in the thick of the, of the disease and, and need significant support because it is a complex chronic disease, but even individuals who are diagnosed early and we really have a, 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 the opportunity to change the progression of the disease and may help them preserve their lung function by working with them to quit smoking and work with them to use their medications on a regular basis and, and maintain their um, nutritional status and, and maintain their functional status and stay active. I think there's, there's a tremendous need for care management at both ends of the spectrum. I really do. Thank you. Very helpful. Sure. And we just had another question submitted. And yes. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Can yes. You see okay. Yes, harmonica right. classes. Yes, harmonica classes marketed towards patients with COPD. I think I would. I think it's wonderful. I think it's very helpful. I, I wouldn't say it's the be all and end all. They they would still need other exercise um, uh, classes or pulmonary rehab, such as you know physical exercise, weightlifting, um, you know cardiovascular exercise. But harmonica is wonderful for breathing classes. Uh, it really does help them improve their breathing and it helps them um, just improve their, their functional status in terms of their lung function. So I think that that is wonderful. So maybe we see that as a real self-management as someone has interest in music and is yes. something we could get them going to win. Oh, ab absolutely. <laughs> yes, I, I would do that in along with the um, physical activity portion of exercise, but yes, you know, lung function exercises are also wonderful. Well, another question I had was around the medications and the care management role there. And looking at what is their current regimen, is that up to date with what yes. is currently advised? What is yes. your thinking around that, Karen? Oh my goodness. Well, when you have, you know, patients and, and I was going to say whether they're elderly or not, because it really doesn't matter. Um, there's, there are so many patients who are seeing, uh, they have, especially if they have multiple com comorbid conditions, they might be seeing multiple specialists. So they are getting medications that sometimes they're getting uh, multiple medications in the same classes or they're getting medications that may be competing or interacting with each other. So I think reconciling those medications is really critical. And then the other part is making sure they understand the medications they're using. If you saw um, when, I, when I was talking about medications, they could be on three different inhalers. And it, we know it's confusing enough. We know it's asthma, and the same thing with COPD. We know which inhaler is this. Is the rescue medicine? This is the one I take every day. Um, how often do I use this one? It's so confusing. And again, with each inhaler comes a different um, device, and with each device comes a, a, a different way of using it. So the, it's just uh, critical that they understand what medications to use, when to use them, how to use them, and then how they interact with all the other medications they're on and make sure that they're not being prescribed um, multiple medications in the same class. So a big part is uh, having the brown bag method. Yes. And yes. invite patients to bring in all of their meds. And bring in all your meds. Yes, yeah, all your meds. All them and yes, all your meds, all your devices, the spacers, everything. And not only watch how they use it, but look at the condition of them. You know, I've seen inhalers that expired 10 years ago. I've seen inhalers that are empty. Uh, you you just never know. So just have, just bring all your devices with you. We'll take a look. We'll go through them when you come in. Great. Anyone else questions? We've got Karen. We've got tapping into her expertise and knowledge. Well, not hearing any other questions or seeing any additional questions on the chat, 
uh, want to thank everyone for attending, and in particular, Karen, thank you for sharing your expertise, your experience. Uh, with not only today but all of the series. If anyone uh, was not able to attend all of them, they are available on the website. You can go back and listen to the recordings. And again, as always, Karen, thank you so much for your uh, willingness to share with all of the care managers and uh, folks managing patients with COPD and asthma. Much appreciated. Thank you, Sue. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. And with that, we will end the webinar today. So thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Karen. Awesome thank job. You. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.